Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for this introduction and also thank you for the opportunity to, to talk here. Um, I see, I mean, it's a, it's a big audience, so I'm, I'm really happy to see and that and also that the, if you want the next generation of, of people um, will learn about inversion data assimilation and, well, in my case, joint inversion. So as Alex said, I have a fairly broad interest in uh, seismology, electromagnetics and, and gravity. And the idea of this joint and constraint inversion is to combine different types of geophysical data and then come up with consistent models. Now, it's a bit of a shame, of course, that didn't uh, the lecture of Martin Samrich didn't happen yesterday because I am going to assume like a basic knowledge of um, inversion methods. I'm not going to explain sort of inversion basics. Uh, and of course, that would have been a nice refresher for, for well, all of us. Um, but I hope that still sort of um, it's understandable enough that, that you, can, you can take something out of this. Um, I also wanted to say that if you have any questions during the lecture, I will sort of take a few breaks in between because there are sort of different segments and I think an hour and a half uh, to wait for this question is quite long. So please write them in the chat. Uh, we just discussed this so you can't speak during the lecture because I think that would be probably a bit too chaotic, uh, but write something in the chat. Um, if you have a question, I'll take a few breaks. Um, to to answer your questions and yeah so so the what I wanted to, to talk about is sort of a variety of things in this talk so first of all is sort of basic concepts of, of joint and constraint inversions um, and a few if you want so recipes or ideas but also um, a bit of a yeah more philosophical idea about how we view the results of inversions and especially these joint and constraint inversions. And um, as the title maybe gives it away uh, as yeah, hypothesis testing tools. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, uh, you'll understand sort of what I mean by this. And I yeah, want to start the um, presentation by um, sort of a, a famous quote from Thomas Henry Huxley, which was also known as Darwin's bulldog because he vigorously defended Darwin's uh, theory of, of evolution. Uh, and he said, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And I think we've all experienced this when we thought we had this great idea how something works in the earth and then uh, reality came and um, sort of told us that this is um, maybe not the case, um, but well, there's a solution to this, well, one solution to this problem comes from uh, sort of a, a theoretical physicist and probably one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. So Albert Einstein said, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. Of course, that's a fairly sort of, yeah, theoretical physics kind of, kind of view. Um, and yeah, one of the points of this lecture is, if you want so, is um to to show you if if you have an, a sort of a negative outcome in your inversions or your, your joint inversions or the hypothesis you have been working with has been slain that there's maybe another way than changing the facts and sort of still learning something about the earth and i think uh, that kind of perspective is is hopefully um useful to some of you yeah, but before we get into this, I want to do, yeah, if you want so a basic recap, a basic tutorial, as I said, I'm going to um, assume that you know something about inversion as such. Hopefully you have performed, used some inversion code on some sort of data um, because, yeah, it's uh, going into the mechanics of inversion that would take this um, sort of a bit too far. Um, so when we want to integrate different data, we have a sort of variety of geophysical data sets. There are various methods um, to, to combine these. And of course, integration is something that's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. And very often it involves mostly uh, comparing models, plotting them to on top of each other. But if we want to go a step further and use some formal integration methods, I see sort of three main um, 
methods here. So what I call joint inversion means that you have one big inversion algorithm, one computational program. You, you put all your geophysical data sets in their rawest form in there. The inversion algorithm does some, something. And then at the end, you get out a, a model or a, a set of models that is designed to explain all the data simultaneously. Another way to do uh, this, and I will talk about uh, that as well in this um, in this lecture, is what I call constraint inversion. So you might not have a one of the data sets. For example, you might not have the seismic data, but only electromagnetic data, or the other way around. So you take that model, or you you extract certain features from this model, and steer the inversion of the other data set in a direction that it, for example, matches the appearance of this seismic model as much as possible. And so one of the models is fixed or one of the inversions um, already has produced the result. You only use that and you um, just perform the inversion um, of one data set um, with, this, with this model as additional input. And then what you can do is also, if you don't have any of the models or you don't have the, the technical possibility to do either joint or constrained inversion, then you can do what is called post-inversion analysis. So you can use a formal algorithm to identify matching structures in the individual inversion results. And this can also be very fruitful, um, but I'm not gonna talk about that here because I haven't done this really very much. Uh, so that's sort of for somebody else to talk about. So, what does a typical joint inversion or uh, inversion approach um, look like? So uh, there's not going to be a lot of maths in this uh, lecture, but here is sort of one of the, if you want, essential equations that I think anybody who has done inversion should have seen. So when you formulate an inversion problem, and here I'm writing this as an electromagnetic inversion problem or magnet magnetotelluric. Uh, it's an electromagnetic technique inversion problem. Um, you typically, for just an individual inversion, um, have two ingredients that you need to define before you can write your algorithm and um, sort of solve your problem. And that's the um, two parts of the so-called objective function, the quantity you want to minimize in the inversion. And typically, those are the data misfit terms. So this is what I call phi MT. So I call it the um, name of the method. And that depends on, in this case, the conductivity sigma. And then you have the so-called regularization term, um, which makes sure that the model doesn't contain any spurious structure. And typically what we use here is some sort of smoothness regularization. So you want to find the smoothness, the smoothest model um, that explains your data and you can balance the different terms, the data misfit and the regularization by this regularization term lambda or sometimes also called the Lagrange multiplier. So hopefully all of you have seen at least some version of this um, because this is, yeah, the, the, if you want to, so the basics of, of individual inversions. So now if we want to turn this into a joint inversion problem, um, we get a slightly more complicated expression. So first of all, I'm writing this as a joint inversion problem of uh, electromagnetics and T and seismology or some seismic method that depends on some sort of seismic velocity. I'm intentionally being a bit sort of vague here, but of course you could write the same for other two methods so gravity and magnetics or whatever you want. And so our objective function now depends on um, seismic velocity and conductivity. We have, again, the misfit term for the electromagnetic data. We now have another term for uh, the data misfit term for the seismic data. And for simplicity, I've written the regularization term as sort of depending on both. Typically, you have them somewhat separately. And one thing you can see is that um, the data misfit terms and the um, for each method, they only depend on one of the parameters. So one depends on conductivity and one uh, depends on velocity. Um, so what we need to define, and this is if you want so 
everything in joint inversion that sort of really determines what kind of joint inversion is doing uh, doing is this coupling term. So you need to define some sort of uh, criterion that says, what is the, my expected relationship between, in this case, velocity and conductivity? And this then is also um, multiplied by some sort of weighting factor that de determines how much you want to enforce this similarity or this, this coupling uh, that, uh, between the different parameters. And there are, if you want, sort of two broad classes of um, coupling that are, in, I would say, in common use um, these days. So one is called structural coupling. And this is based on the idea that, okay, even if the methods are quite different, they sense the Earth differently, there is only one geology. Yeah, so if you have an interface between two different rock formations, then it is likely that there's a change in both um, properties in velocity and conductivity. Um, and so you can use that as a um, way to couple your, your methods. You might not know exactly how those things change. Um, at that boundary, but you, you can assume, or it's reasonable to assume that the boundary is present in all the methods uh, that you use. Uh, and one method that is very popular at the moment is the so-called cross gradient that was published by Gallardo and Meju in 2003, because it makes very weak assumptions about how these structures are connected. So. Um, you would say that in virtually any imaginable situation in the earth, uh, the cross gradient is probably a fairly reasonable thing that you can do. So it's very widely applicable. You don't need to put in a lot of, if you want, so prior knowledge to, to assume this. Uh, so that it's uh, uh, very commonly used for joint inversion at the moment. So if you want to know more about that, you should look at the um, Gallardo and Major paper and the sort of literature that cites those. Another um, possibility is to work directly with the parameters. So you can di directly relate velocity and resistivity, um, or you can um, make some sort of constraint where you say, okay, I want to have a one to one relationship between them, or you can define some sort of clustering. But of course, this requires much stronger assumptions about what you put in to the inversion as a um, sort of relationship between those two quantities. And you, if you're in a, in a region, you let's say in exploration geophysics, you might have borehole data, um, or for some materials, we have theoretical models, what the velocity and the resistivity should, should behave like, uh, you, can, you can put that in. But there's always, if you want so an inherent danger um, that you're using um, a, a wrong assumption there. And partially what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, this hypothesis testing approach um, is how can we deal with this situation where we sort of want to, want to see if a certain relationship is reasonable. And yeah, so it provides a very strong coupling between the different methods, uh, much stronger than the structure, structural coupling. But of course, if it's wrong, then you also get um, artifacts. And I will now show you some, some, some set of very simple examples, hopefully instructive, um, that demonstrate both the structural coupling and this parameter relationships on some, some very simple models. So the um, tests I'm going to show you is, a, is if you want, so uh, the first type of inversion that you probably can do as a, as a, as a student, um, maybe even in a lecture course. Um, so here on the left hand side, I have an electromagnetic test model. Um, of three layers. So, and you can see this is, if you want to so near surface geophysics, but the scale in this sense is completely irrelevant. Um, we have an upper layer of 100 ohm meters, then we have an, an anomaly of one ohm meter, and then it goes back to 100 ohm meters. And on the right hand side, 
um, for some of you who you know, might be interested in, for example, in electromagnetic data, uh, this is the data that would come out of this model. So you can see here the so-called apparent resistivity curve that sort of reflects that model in a sense uh, of uh, we start at 100 ohmmeters, we see something, a decreased apparent resistivity, so an expression of this conductor, and then we go back to 100 ohmmeters. And the inversion I'm running here is, um, yeah, as I said, extremely simply. All I assume that I know the thickness and the resistivity of the uppermost layer and the resistivity of the lowermost layer. And all I'm looking for is the thickness and the resistivity of this middle layer. So I have exactly two inversion parameters. Um, and the reason I do it that simply is that then I can explore the whole parameter space. I can show you all the possible solutions to the problem as simple um, parameter plots um, in the plane. So this is what I'm showing you here. So this blue region, that's the uh, region of acceptable models. So these are all the models that fit the data within a specified uncertainty. I think I used a couple of percent here. So the true model is the, the red dot, uh, and then the blue models, uh, the blue region are all the acceptable models. And again, I hope you have seen at least these concepts um, in, in principle, so that we could, would call the, the fact that we have this space here, the, the null space, and any model um, that lies within this blue region is from, from a data misfit perspective, um, an acceptable model, and if you run an inversion algorithm, depending on where you start, you might end up in any region here um, in, the, in this blue area. But of course, our goal typically is to get as close as possible to the true model to this red dot. Um, and we can also see the sort of the typical things. So if you did a formal analysis uh, of our inverse problem, we would say, okay, we have an uncertainty in the layer thickness here between 23 and 59 meters. So actually quite substantial. Uh, and we can also see a, a trade-off between um, layer resistivity and layer thickness. Uh, and you can do this formal analysis if you know a bit about um, magnetotelluric data. Uh, you, you know that actually we resolve the conductance, so the product of um, thickness and resistivity and not the two um, things independently. Uh, yeah, so that's a, a very basic individual inversion uh, for uh, magnetotelluric data. And now I'm going to pair this with another data set. And I decided again, something hopefully um, some of you have seen maybe in an initial lecture um, with seismic travel time data. So on the right hand side here, we have um, another model, again, there is sort of the same three layer thicknesses, uh, but as seismic velocities go, they increase with, with depth. So that's what I have uh, mimicked here. Um, and then on the left hand side, you can see the travel times from those different layers. So you can see that the color coding um, here is the, the direct wave. And that's the, the first thing that we would record. And then you can see the other waves. And then the black line, that's the combined uh, first arrival travel time curve uh, that we would get um, if we were to make a seismic refraction experiment. And what you can, can see, and again, you might have heard this in, in a lecture, uh, the second layer the, the, is only a first arrival for a very short range of offsets. So this is what would, we would call a hidden layer. So the um, a seismic inversion is not particularly great at, at finding the parameters of this hidden layer. And we can do the same analysis uh, as before, we can plot the range of acceptable models for this kind of um, inversion. And this is what we get. Um, so similar situation as for, for the MT, we have the true model here, we have a region of acceptable models. Uh, but for example, the uh, range of acceptable thicknesses is a bit smaller than for the MT. So we only have 31 to 49 meters. But we also have this trade-off between layer thickness and velocity. So we have different combinations of 
velocity and thickness that can actually match um, our observations. So the idea of putting all this together in a, in a joint inversion, if you want to, so in, in the classical sense, is okay. Uh, one constraints um, the, maybe the thickness is a bit better. Uh, so I want to utilize that uh, to improve my results and reduce the space of acceptable models, assuming that, for example, the layer thicknesses are the same. So that's the first um, idea. Uh, so this and this is, if you want, to so the simplest form of structure, structural coupling. You have a 1D model and you say, OK, uh, the, the, I don't know, know anything really about velocities and resistivities in those layers, but the, the boundaries, for example, in a sedimentary environment, the, the, the horizons, they should be the same. Uh, and that's what we get here. So again, I'm plotting the um, space of acceptable models and the true model, and then the blue is the projection of the um, seismic information onto the, the magnetotelluric information. And we can see that we have successfully reduced the range of acceptable models. And in this case, um, because the, 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 the seismics um, has a better resolution for the depth, that what really determines uh, the um, the range of acceptable models here, and we have mainly improved the MT in this case. Of course, in reality, when you don't have such a simple inverse problem where you only have these two parameters, but you have various layers, it, it becomes more complex. So it could be, for example, that the MT is a bit better at resolving the thickness of the upper layer, and then the seismics is better at resolving the thickness of the lower layer, and the two um, sort of help each other and, and you, you, you get a better model. But I think th for the simple example, you can see that um, here the, the size mix really helps to, to constrain the thickness of this layer for the MT as well. Uh, now, one thing we can do is um, instead of doing a joint inversion, we can pick a seismic model as a constraint and say, OK, I want to do an MT inversion where the layer thickness is as close as possible to the um, seismic model. So you have a fixed seismic model. Uh, and then you make the MT inversion, fit the MT data, but also adhere to the layer boundaries that you get from the seismic model. And this is now, again, the same picture. You can see how the orange region stays the same, because that's just the uh, uncertainty from the MT. And the blue region has decreased even further. So, and this is when I first saw this was even for me was a bit of a surprising result. So when you do uh, a constraint inversion, and then you do sort of formal um, uncertainty analysis, uh, you, um, sorry, I was just trying, I didn't mean to go back there. I was just trying to get the chat up as well. Um, so, um, no, Max, I am very sorry. It's a, you don't need to, to look in the chat. I will, I will do it. And during the break, it is better. Just okay. go forward, not looking, because sometimes the questions are quite general, and it's okay. better to discuss later. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yep. I just wanted to make sure that I'm not miss, you know, sort of talking over people said or sort of speeding past them. So I was here on the on the constraint. So this is the constraint inversion result, and yeah, you can see that the the range of models is even tighter. So a formal analysis shows us that we have less uncertainty. Um, which yeah might seem counterintuitive, but the explanation for this is that we're basically taking the uncertainty of the seismic data out of the equation because we have picked a single model and we've said, okay, we, we assume that this model is sort of representative of the truth. So we only allow sort of small variations uh, from the um, from this model. And as such, the, the uncertainty, of the MT inversion under this assumption is reduced even further. So we get a very tight boundary here on 
our um, range of acceptable models from this constraint invariant. So if you have um, a very good model that you think is a very good representation of the Earth, then a constraint inversion can really yeah, focus on these features and sh show you if the other methods can sort of match these features as well. So this is yeah a very simple um, structural inversion. And, and we can see that, yeah, there is some interaction between the methods. But for example, in this case, um, it's all driven by the seismics because for this one layer, the seismics really has the, the better resolution cap capabilities and, and there's not much information going back from the MT to the seismics. But this changes if we assume a parameter relationship. So a parameter relationship means that we say we know something how there's uh, about the connection between um, seismic velocity and apparent resistivity. And here I've uh, sort of generated some, some theoretical or hypothetical relationship between uh, like a linear relationship between uh, velocity and log conductivity. And if anybody has here has ever looked at something like borehole data or um, even sort of some, some lab data, you will know that these things tend to scatter quite wildly at times. So the true relationship is uh, this um, blue, blue line here and actually the, the sort of relationship or the true value for this layer that I assume is marked by this red dot. And then the black dots here are the generated from this blue line, but with quite a significant random scatter on it. Um, and then the, the other line, that's what I call the biased relationship, is um, sort of constructed saying, OK, you know, based on the scatter of this data, and if you don't know the true relationship, um, these two lines, the true and the biased relationship, they're probably all um, or both good representation of this data. I mean, if you didn't know the underlying true value, um, this biased line compared to the, the scatter of those, those black dots um, seems like a, like, a, like, like a reasonable fit, yes? Uh, you would say, okay, it's quite noisy, but it, it goes through all the points and this is, is quite close to the center. So this reflects the difficulty in really estimating these kind of relationships. Yes, we, we have some ideas what they should look like, um, but uh, the details can be, um, can be a bit different. So um, now we can, go sort of look at this in both spaces because we can easily project from, from resistivity, velocity, and, and vice versa. So the orange region here is going back to the individual seismic inversion. So that's the, uh, the range of acceptable models uh, from the seismic inversion. And now the blue is for, for this joint inversion under this parameter relationship. So we can see by, by making the connection stronger, we've now also uh, created a stronger interaction between the methods and we have reduced this, the space also for, for the seismic models because at some point the MT resistivity just exceeds certain values or deviates too strongly from the relationship uh, and the inversion says, okay, this is not compatible with um, our assumptions anymore. And so we restrict this even further. And if we go back to the MT um, plot, we can also see, again, orange, the original one. Green is here the um, projected complete uh, seismic uncertainty. And blue is the, the joint, uh, so the intersection of those two sets the joint uncertainty. So we can see that if we consider this, this relationship as exact, then uh, we get a very tight um, range of acceptable models. So we, we really sort of focus on this true model. And this is, if you want, so the classical view of, of joint inversion or the classical goal uh, of uh, joint inversion, if you have very good information. If you the pieces that you put into your your puzzle are very good, then 
with a joint inversion approach and a, and a strong coupling, you can really get close to the true model with very little uncertainty. The issue, though, is that if I, instead of using this true relationship in my joint inversion, I use a, the biased relationship, then the situation looks like this. So again, here is the individual inversions. Now we can see that the, the seismic information projects slightly differently from velocity to resistivity because we're using, instead of the true relationship, we're using something um, with a different slope. And so the whole thing becomes offset. And that um, now the intersection, so if we do the joint inversion, we get this really tight space here where, where we would say if we run a joint inversion, uh, the algorithm would end up somewhere in, the, in this blue region. But the problem is the true model, the true value is not contained in the, um, the joint inversion result anymore. So we get a joint inversion um, result. Yes, we can fit both data sets and the, the intersection is this, this blue region. Um, if we do a formal analysis, and this could be like something fancy like Markov chain Monte Carlo, but it could also be some sort of linearized uh, uncertainty resolution analysis, it would tell us, oh, you have a very good result. Yes, your uncertainty is extremely small, but unfortunately, the true model is not part of, of your solution. Yes, so it's, you're outside um, the uncertainty, um, you can find only the true model. And yeah, in this, if you want so classical explorative view of, of joint inversion, that's, that's a problem, right? You've, you've put in your information to the best of your knowledge, and, but the result that you get is, is biased. And so the um, yeah, classical thing is either to say, okay, I need to maybe work with um, less strong assumptions. And that's why the cross gradient uh, is, um, so popular, or you need to explore different kinds of possible um, parameter relationships. And sort of after thinking about this for, for some time, I thought, okay, there's actually a third option. And that's uh, instead of saying, okay, we use the joint inversion with a, um, a parameter relationship and hope that it's sort of true. Uh, we go even sort of further or turn it, turn it around a bit and use it to exclude certain parameter relationships because we could change our parameter relationship even more. And at some point we would get the result that, okay, there is nothing that can fit um, the, the data and our parameter relationship at the same time. And this then give, also gives us some information. It gives us the information that what we're assuming here about the relationship of the parameter cannot be. And so we can exclude that. We can say, this is not a possibility. And this is what I'm gonna elaborate now on uh, as part of this hypothesis uh, testing approach. Um, yeah, so this was my idea here that to take, uh, oh, I'll talk about this first and then take a, take a minute or two if there are any concrete questions about these examples, because while they are quite elementary, I hope, and related to things you've seen, there might be some, some questions about sort of what's happening here. So yeah, the, the consequences that we can, um, or conclusions that we can draw from this, okay, we, when we have joint and constraint inversions, we restrict the space of acceptable models. And of course, that's very nice, that's very good, and that's what we want. And if our constraint model, if the, the input that we use as a constraint for our, our inversion is, is good, we get stronger restrictions than from a joint inversion because we're eliminating the, the, the variability of the, of the seismic model. And this, this coupling method really, um, and the, the parameters of coupling are, are crucial and have very strong effects of, on the results. So you can see how, depending on what I used, I got quite different range of acceptable models. And yeah, I was starting to sort of um, elaborate on this. So there are two possible views that you can take. You can say, okay, I'm using this in 
in what I would call explorative mode or exploration mode. Um, so if you know an accurate or true uh, relationship, then the models that come out of your joint inversion will also be accurate or true or representative of the Earth. Um, but of course, that's often quite difficult and we often don't even know how accurate sort of our relationships are, how accurate the, the, the things that we use to connect the different methods are. So that's where I would then say you can switch into what I call the hypothesis best, uh, based mode. So we say we, we specify a coupling and this is equivalent to formulating a hypothesis that we want to test. And yeah, those of you who have done maybe a bit of statistics know that then the most powerful thing you can do is you can specify the hypothesis in a way that you can then reject it because that then tells you conclusively that, okay, this is not a viable relationship between those different, um, different um, parameters. Okay, are there any concrete question? I see there is one. So 